Author Mark Fisher's 2014 book, Ghosts of My Life, details the concept of the lost future. This is the idea that we've been continually anticipating a future that never came. We expected advancements in technology to change everything, from philosophy to art to culture itself. But instead, what we've gotten is the same classic Western consumerist culture shown to us on higher resolution screens. Mark posits that nothing about our culture has fundamentally changed since the 1980s. However, there's one issue with Mark's argument that I would like to address. Mark Fisher was f***ing wrong, baby. The company Mischief is heralding in a new era of contemporary culture. And look, this may feel overdone, I'm talking about the boots again. The boots, that's like two weeks ago. That's like four years in internet time. I'm telling you, they're important. They're so significant in ways we can't even understand yet. They're like the most important symbol of the 2020s. And look at them, they're literally a symbol. This is Plato's cave now, we're talking symbols. Like before I really get into the meat and bones of why these boots are important, we gotta talk about the company that made them. The key to understanding these boots, lies with an understanding Mischief, the company. And Mischief is like no other business operating right now. Mischief was started in 2016 by an ex-BuzzFeed employee named Gabriel Whaley. After Gabriel got bored of making quizzes for BuzzFeed, he decided he wanted full creative autonomy. Whaley's philosophy going into Mischief was the desire to create things that will naturally go viral without catering to an algorithm or hype. And initially, the company was just a viral marketing agency doing meme campaigns for companies like Casper Mattresses. But they stopped taking clients in 2019 to focus on their own ventures. Their first viral hit were these Jesus Air Max 97s with holy water in the soul. Riffing on the proliferation of collaborations in streetwear, the company says that these shoes are like an imagined collaboration between Jesus and Nike. The Jesus shoes were Mischief's seventh drop. A drop is what they refer to their product launches as, but that's kind of confusing because it's not like every drop is a purchasable product. For example, their next drop just two weeks later was an app that suggests stocks to invest in based on your astrological sign. And these drops have come every two weeks since late 2019. They've gone all over the board consistently consisting of things like shoes, apps, food, and also more traditional white wall gallery pieces. And look, I don't want to give you a company history of mischief here. You can go watch an AI generated video essay read by a Fiverr voice actor if you want to see that. What I really want to drive home is the absurdity of mischief's business. This is because they're not even really a business, nor are they an art collective. The company as a whole is an art piece. Although their product line goes all over the place, the underlying theme is a cynical parody on businesses and consumer culture. And actually that sort of parody isn't anything new. You can find that type of commentary if you go back through the decades to Adbusters spoof ads, or Barbara Kruger's high culture critiques of capitalism, or John Carpenter's film They Live, where the protagonist finds a pair of glasses that shows him the hidden messages behind advertisements. In fact, this sort of in-your-face critiques on consumer culture are so overdone that they're kind of spoofable now. Just look at the artist Banksy, who's come under fire for being very shallow and kind of, again, <laughs> really painfully on the nose. But mischief evades this criticism. Mischief isn't a meme. You can't make fun of mischief. You can't call mischief cringy. The way that mischief has stood clear of this criticism is really interesting. But to understand that, we have to go back a bit farther and talk about data. Now what the f is data? Data. The art movement. Data. Everyone knows data, okay? That is like a loose collection of artists that dominated Central Europe in the early 20th century. It's a very avant-garde art movement, and the whole thing is designed to be anti-art. Data has one of the most complicated histories of any art movement, and if I try to explain it to you, I'm gonna have a complete psychotic lapse. <laughs> so, instead of that, let's start in 1917 with Marcel Duchamp. Although there's a lot of artists who fall under the data umbrella, Marcel Duchamp is easily the most famous adherent. I'm sure this image, Marcel Duchamp's 1917 piece Fountain is well known to anybody watching this video. The whole purpose behind this piece is that it's just a urinal. There's nothing else about it. It's a commentary on what we call art and what we don't call art, right? Like what makes something art? Here's the magic about this piece. And it's something that Marcel Duchamp didn't intend to happen because you can't really have that kind of hindsight. This piece is simultaneously the most deconstructive piece for its time of what we call fine art and also the best example of what fine art is, right? It simultaneously deconstructs an institution while being the most artiest art that could ever exist. When people critique modern art, when people say, I think modern art is trash, this is what they're referring to, even though it's a deconstruction of what art is. And whether you hate this piece and think it's completely garbage, or you think this is the most genius piece of art to ever be created, you're both right. All perspectives on this piece are right. It is both those things. How is it both these things? 
because this piece employs something called meta irony. Meta irony is like irony with another layer. When you're unable to tell if something is sincere or ironic, then every interpretation becomes right and wrong. I actually asked Chad GPT to define meta irony very simply, and I broke it. I broke Chad GPT. So uh, this is like new levels of knuckleheadery with this definition here. A classic example of meta irony is the platform 4chan. The anonymity and lack of tone makes every post the sincere ramblings of a psychopathic white supremacist and the edgy shit posting of a 13 year old Mexican kid. Not to retread old ground, if you're chronically online, the definition of meta irony is nothing new to you. The internet has been operating meta ironically for like 10 years now. If you don't go outside very often, you probably don't realize that no one else thinks this way. No one else thinks of fucking meta irony at all. The reason meta irony hasn't made it through to pop culture yet is because an already existing platform or brand or consumer good can't become meta ironic. It kind of has to be meta ironic from the start. Nike couldn't make a meta ironic ad about Air Force Ones and how they're like the most human shoe ever and that only normies and NPCs wear them. People would just get mad. It would just wouldn't make sense to people, right? It's not meta ironic. Something has to be meta ironic from the beginning. And look, meta irony. That's cool, that's fun, that's dandy. Everyone loves a bit of meta irony. But what the f does that have to do with mischief? What does data have to do with mischief? What am I talking about? Am I making look, sense? Here's the big kicker, okay? Here's the fucking red pill. Meta irony is the only way for a consumer product to have sustained growth. I make contemporary art theory and culturally critical YouTube videos. And there's probably like 10,000 people in the world that are interested in what I do. And I already have 4,000 of them subscribed, so uh, my time's running out. If a product is meta ironic, it can be enjoyed by anybody for any reason. There is no target audience. You get something like the Big Red Boots, which can be enjoyed from an art perspective, or enjoyed from a hype perspective, enjoyed from a fashion perspective. You can see it as a harbinger of the fucking end times, as a sign of the devilish and decadent times we live in. Everyone's right. When I mentioned at the very beginning of the video how Gabriel Whaley set out to make viral products without catering to algorithms or hype, this is how he's done it, by using meta irony. Mischief's products and the organization as a whole are meta-ironic. That's what I meant when I said the company as a whole is an art piece. Their products exist both as critiques of consumer culture while being emblematic of consumer culture. And the big red boots are simultaneously an art piece, a parody of consumer culture, and also being traded on StockX for $1,300. I want you to think of meta-irony like the punk movement. By the time punk fully broke into mainstream culture in 1991 with Nirvana's Nevermind, it had already existed for like 12 years. American hardcore had already existed since the late 70s. It was nothing new to people who had enjoyed it for the last decade. Just only now was it breaking into pop culture. And whether you believe it or not, culture has not been meta-ironic yet. Certified Lover Boy is not a meta-ironic album, or even just an ironic album. You, you, you look at this and you're like, okay, this has to be a joke. There has to be some self-awareness in this. There isn't. Crop top sweaters, tech wear, the broccoli cut. It, they're all sincere. There's nothing ironic about the broccoli cut. Only time will tell how meta-irony will do on a large scale. We haven't seen something as popular as like the Air Force One low enjoyed meta-ironically. But who knows? Maybe one day in 10 years, we all wear ridiculous clothes for ridiculous reasons. We're so separated by ideology that you can't even relate to the person beside you because everyone's so entrenched in meta-irony. Just remember, if you kill yourself, you miss the big show.